By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim? Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And today we are back at the X-Points Dutch Open held in Rosendaal, the Netherlands. And we're going to look at a very cool match. Two really cool decks, cool players playing against each other. We have Edwin versus Clint. And I believe Edwin is playing with the deck called Africa. So it's a deck um, all about the African continent, a journey to the African continent. And he's taking on Clint. And Clint has made a deck uh, around the card, the Evil Eye of Orms by Gore. One of my favorite cards in the game, actually. Also because of the history. This card is designed uh, based on a D&D &D campaign of one of the designers of the sets. I mean, that's just really funny, that backstory of that card. And the card itself, look at the art. It's so cool. So, two really cool decks going face to face. Now, if you're wondering what does X points mean again, just check the description below because there I have links and more information about this specific rule set. Um, so, if you want to know more about that, check the description. And in that same description below, you can also find several timestamps. One of those timestamps reads MTG Games. And if you click on there, you're going to go straight to the games and then you can check out the deck tech section later. I know some people prefer to do that. And in that same description, you can also find a little tiny modest link to the Timmy Talks Patreon page. Because yes, I have my very own Patreon page. I have over 200 patrons, which I'm super happy with. But I'm always, of course, looking for more support so that I can continue make this content for you guys so if you enjoy and girls of course so if you enjoy the content that i make make sure to visit patreon.com slash timmy talks and consider becoming a patron of the show it already starts for just one dollar a month okay and now that you're all informed i'm going to start with the deck decks i'm going to start with the africa deck let's have a look and here we see the deck of Edwin. So like I said in the introduction, it's called Africa, or maybe we should call it A Journey to Africa. He actually had a little book with him where he wrote down how each card in this deck connects to Africa. So I thought that was really cool. He put a lot of effort into it. Um, and you could actually win a Spice Prize at the event as well. So it's always really cool to see players going for that. I believe he also had a tie-on with an African motive. So he went, he went all the way. He went all the way. And I, I really I really appreciate that. I love that kind of quirkiness in the old school scene. Um, when we're just looking at this deck from a play perspective, it is white, it is green, usually colors that, you know, you can play out your cards pretty quickly. It's known for the Urnum Geddon strategy. This is not an Urnum Geddon deck. We don't see Armageddon. We don't see the Urnums in here. We do see a lot of cheap creatures. We've got Savannah Lines. We've got the Nafst Asp. It's always hard for me to pronounce that. Um, you know, we've got the Barbary Apes, we've got the Osai Vulture, so just a lot of cheaper creatures. And then kind of on the on the curve later in the game, the high curve, we've got our uh, War Elephants, beautiful from uh, Arabian Nights. Such a beautiful card, 2-2 Bander. Um, then we also see Giant Spiders, who are just perfect to deal uh, with Hypnotic Spectres. And in X-Points, you're going to see a lot of Hypnotic Spectres. Like, that's one of the things... Uh, when you're going to play this format, you have to think, how am I going to deal with the Hypnotic Spectre, right? Because if you don't have a quick answer for it, you usually die. So that's definitely in, in the back of my head. Like, okay, I need an answer for the for the Hippie. And Giant Spider is a beautiful, beautiful answer, old school answer to that, actually. And what I also like is Giant Spider in combination with Giant Growth, because you can make a Giant Giant Spider. Sorry for shouting. Uh, <laughs> but just that's what I always do when I see a Giant Growth on a Giant Spider. Um, and then you can gobble up like a Sarah Angel. You can you can even gobble up like a Shivan Dragon. You cannot eat up a Mahamoti, unfortunately, because you only have five power and not six. So then you would need an extra Giant Growth. But just that idea that the Giant Spider gets even bigger and just kills a, a Sarah out of the sky, like takes it down, that's pretty impressive in in my mind. And then we also see uh, the, the Boars, Dirk, Dirkwood Boars. Dirkwood Boars... It's a vanilla 4-4, four, four, right? Um, it's one green and four. And I always find that kind of good about the card. It's only one green and then four colorless. So in essence, this is really good card to play in a multicolor deck. I think, um, especially in, in a format like the X-Points, where you're playing according to Atlantic rules, where you don't have the Suchi as much, because Suchi now hurts. When Suchi dies, you gain four generic mana, right? But that means a mana burn, potential mana burn of four. So you take four damage if your opponent times it right. So it's very risky to play with the Suchi in X points. So there you see maybe that cards like Dirkwood Boars have more chance to shine. Obviously, it's still five mana, and there are a lot of better cards to play for five that are four fours, usually flyers. But the fact it's only one green 
You know what I mean? I feel, okay, that's kind of the unique selling point of the Dirkwood Boars. Obviously, the problem here is Urnum Jin, which is one green and three for a four five. You know, so that's kind of awkward. But hey, uh, I love the fact that he's playing with Dirkwood Boars. And I think Dirkwood Boars is, like I said, kind of a little bit better than many players give it credit for. But maybe I'm being a bit too optimistic with the Boars. I just really like the card. Let me know in the comments if you kind of, you know, get what I mean. Uh, when we're looking at the rest, we also see two GM Day Tomes, which is also a card you usually see in more controlling decks. Uh, we also see a, um, a Diamond Valley. I think Diamond Valley, again, is a card that, in my opinion, is quite good in the current meta of old school overall, because a lot of decks are playing more aggressive strategies, like playing four chains, four bolts, four psionic blasts, and you can just get burned out very quickly. And then if you have that one Diamond Valley or you have that one Life Gain card, you know, that can make all the difference. Because if those decks run out of steam, you usually win the game, right? They just need to hurt you and need to end the game quick. But with cards like Diamond Valley, you can kind of ruin their plans, meaning you're probably going to take the game instead of them. The same thing goes for Divine Offering, which is a really good card um, because it, it's end Life Gain and it's instant speed artifact removal. So it's, it's really good. Overall... It's looking like a fun deck. He's just playing with a lot of creatures. It's not looking like the strongest deck, but it's definitely a cool deck. And remember the theme, A Journey to Africa. I love it. Anyway, let's take a look at the deck of his opponent, Clint. And here we see the deck of Clint. So there's more than meets the eye. That is the name of the deck. And uh, let's just start with Evil Eye because I kind of feel that's the centerpiece of this deck. So Evil Eye of Orms by Gore is a creature from Legends, 3-6 for one black and four. That reads, none of your creatures can attack except for evil eyes. Evil eye can only be blocked by wolves. So in other words, if you have this creature down, you can no longer attack with your other creatures. Um, you know, but I think looking at this deck, he doesn't really want to. So evil eye is basically the only creature that has a substantial amount of power that you want to attack with. And the deck really is all about kind of stopping the opponent, isn't it? We see uh, four darknesses, which is basically a black fog. Uh, we see three uh, Maze of If here that can, of course, stop the opponent as well. And then what goes together really well with this kind of passive strategy, that is, of course, the Underworld Dreams. Underworld Dreams, uh, an enchantment from Legends for three black that reads, every time your opponent draws a card, he takes a damage. It's as simple as that. So you just want to play out your Underworld Dreams, kind of hide behind your Mazes of If, uh, you know, play your Darknesses if the pressure gets uh, gets onto you so, that you so you don't take any damage. And then at the right moment, you're going to play your evil eye. Well, right moment, when you have it and you can cast it, you're going to, you're going to play your evil eye. And then you're just going to also attack with it and kind of slowly, from a controlling position, kill your opponent. Now, of course, there are a few cards in here that kind of can accelerate you. You've got your Birds of Paradise that are quite good. Um, you also have your Dark Ritual. So if you can get a Dark Ritual turn one, you can have an Underworld Dreams turn one, which is really, really good. Like, people... Nobody used to do that... Uh, three, four years ago, or maybe two, three years ago, I'm not quite sure, but at a certain point, I started seeing people doing this more and more, where, hey, you're playing Dark Ritual turn one, not to cast a hippie, but to play an Underworld Dreams instead. And it turns out that's a really good strategy, because then your opponent takes damage from the get-go, and that kind of goes faster than you think. I mean, you're on 20, but before you know it, you're like on eight or something, because you keep taking the damage from that one Underworld Dreams. It goes quite fast. Um, now, there's one card here that I need to highlight as well, because it's just so cool to see this card. That is Word of Command. Now, Word of Command is kind of a rules nightmare. It's too black to cast for an instant. And I'm just going to read the text to you first and then kind of discuss. Um, so what it does, it says, look at target opponent's hand and choose a card from it. You control that player until Word of Command finishes resolving. The player plays that card if able. While doing so, the player can activate mana abilities only if they're from lands that player controls and if mana they produce is spent to activate other mana abilities of lands the player controls and or to play that card. If the chosen card is cast as a spell, you control the player while the, while the spell is resolving. Wow, that's, that's a lot of text. So... One of the issues with this is, okay, if I'm, gonna play, if I'm going to play this in the upkeep of my opponent and then, I, you know, untap upkeep and then I want to take over the hand, can I then still play everything out? Now, the answer is actually, um, well, depending that, that he has the mana for it, the answer is yes. Because to play a card, and this is like there are extra notes added to this card. If you, if you look at it on the gatherer, there's a lot of information about it. But one of the things that struck me, one of the notes there 
is that to play a card is to either cast a spell or to put a land onto the battlefield using the main phase special action. Meaning if you would play it on the end step or in the upkeep, you can play out a sorcery, you know, you can play out a land, you can play out a creature, you can do that. Now remember, you can only choose one card though. Um, and your opponent can of course respond to word of command. So you can tap your mana in response, but then you have to do something with that mana. If you don't do anything with that mana, they're simply in your mana pool and your opponent can still use them, who has casted the word of command. But one of the things that you can do, and this is a mistake that I actually made recently, I was playing some kind of casual game, I can't remember, and this opponent played a word of command, and um, I kind of thought, oh, that's so cool, and I looked at the card, and I read the text, I'm like, oh yeah, I know this card, and I gave him my hand, and then um, he took out a card, I believe it was a drain life, and he killed one of my creatures, and it was, it was a pretty good move from his side, and then after the game, he told me, he said, well, you actually had a clay statue on board and you could have used your, your mana to make regeneration shields for your clay statue. And then the word of command, you know, give the hand to me. And then there's no mana anymore for me. And I couldn't have played the, the drain life and probably you would have won the game. And so I thought, oh yeah, of course, if you have some kind of mana sink, there can also be a Mishra's Factory, right? You can play Word of Command and in response, you can pump all your mana into your Mishra's Factory and just animate it like 10 times. So Word of Command is a good card. Uh, it's an interesting card, but there are ways to play around it. And that's probably why you don't see it that often. And of course, it's also a card that's not reprinted. So it's a bit harder to get. It's got a pretty high price tag, but that's why I love seeing players playing with it. So it's, it's in the deck of Clint today and Clint, I hope we're going to see you use it and then we can have a whole discussion how the card actually works. Um, if you have questions about Word of Command, feel free to write them down in the comments and I'll try to explain it to you. Um, but yeah, I, I'm actually not a judge and I'm not that good with rules all the time, but I do play a lot of old school. So a lot of questions do come up often. So maybe I'm able to help you if you have a question about the card, but there's definitely a lot of information about this card already on the Gatherer and also on Scryfall itself. Um, anyway, this is the deck of Clint. I like it. I think both decks are looking really cool. They both want to do something that's different. They're both playing with cards that you don't see all, all day long or all the time. So I'm excited about this match. So uh, let's go, shall we? And have a look at, uh, I believe this is a round number three match in the Swiss at the Dutch X-Points Open. Here we go. Game number one, here we go. So we've got the player with the green white deck called Africa on the left. That's Edwin here. Starting with a uh, Savannah. Is he going to play a Savannah Lions with Savannah? No, it's an Asp. 1-1 one, one from Arabian Nights. Passing the turn to Clint. So Clint is playing the green black deck. That's called There's More Than Meets the Eyes. So he's playing with a full play set of Evil Eye of Orange by Gore. And a lot of like cards to protect him from taking damage. I like the Maze of If. Three in total. He's also playing with a play set of Darkness in his deck. And as you can see... Clint's got a nice tie to fit his deck, which is named Africa, and he's in a suit as well. There's a desert, there's the attack, of course, sending the ass back with the maze, passing the turn. No more creatures, though, from Edwin. That surprises me a little. His deck is very creature-heavy. There's a forest into an elf there, the 1-1. One, one. The Elves of Deep Shadow, you can tap it for a black, but then you also take a damage. And black mana is quite important for Clint. He's also playing with... Uh, ooh, he's, got, he's got a lot of beers there, Clint. You've got two. You've got some work to do. But he's playing with uh, Underworld Dreams. And of course, you need some black mana to cast that. There's a JM Day Tome here from uh, from Edwin. So he's going for the, uh, a bit of a slower route. There's a Bayou. Tapping another green. Ooh, there's a Scavenger Folk. So that's really good. He can uh, explode... Sacrifice the Scavenger Folk, I mean, to uh, destroy the uh, Gem Day Tome. So Scavenger Folk is a 1-1 one, one from the dark, and you can pay a green tap and sack it to destroy an artifact. Bit of a glitch on the line there. We had some uh, some difficulty with the connection. But it should uh, go away any moment. There we go. And now we've got a normal connection again. So Edwin played a land, I believe. That's it. Players kind of discussing here. It's a very relaxed atmosphere. I have to say in general, if you go to old school events, it's very relaxed. That's what I like about them. It's very much about the gathering as well, not just about the game. And he's gonna go for his mana. What's in, in his hand there? Is that a divine offering, one of the cards? 
Ooh, and again, the screen is kind of glitched. I believe he passed a turn here. Clint's playing out a City of Brass. So he's got four lands. What is he going to do? Tapping the Bayou, taking a damage though. Ooh, two damage. Are we going to see an Underworld Dreams? There is the Underworld Dreams. And then I wonder if you're, if you're Clint, do you want to blow up the Tome? Because the Tome kind of helps you get closer to actually killing your opponent. And uh, in response to the Underworld Dreams, Edwin could have chosen to draw to uh, draw a card. Perhaps he did. Yeah, he's not taking the damage, so I guess he did. And then now he's going to draw a card for turn, now taking a damage from the Underworld Dreams. And I believe Clint is playing with a full playset of Underworld Dreams and then a full playset of Evil Eye of Orms. That's kind of how he wants to win the game with those eight cards in his deck. There we see Edwin tapping six. What are we going to see for six? Oh, there's a Desert Twister. Destroying the Underworld Dreams. Wow, that's a lot of work. But hey, it gets it done. Another really good target for the Twister would have been the Maze of If. Because I feel that's kind of a nuisance as well for uh, for Edwin. But he's not in a hurry, apparently. Taking it easy. And I expected him actually to have a lot more creatures on the board at this stage in the game when I looked at his deck. There we see Clint tapping a green and a bayou. What are we going to see? There's a Birds of Paradise and a Will-O-The-Wisp. Okay, so more defense. Yeah, both players playing very... Well, actually, one player playing very defensive, which is Clint. And Edwin, when you look at the list, should play a bit more offensive, but it's kind of uh, kind of went onto the control right now as well. There's another Asp. So the Asp is a 1-1 one -one creature. When it attacks and you don't block it, uh, you actually get a counter. Well, if it deals damage, I should say. You get an Asp counter, and then you have until your upkeep to pay one mana to get rid of the counter. If you don't, then you take an extra damage. And one of the things that you have to remember with the Asp, and that's why it's, you know, not that great of a card, is you can also pay that mana at any time. So you can do it in the end step of your opponent as well. It's not just your upkeep that you can pay for it. And now we see uh, Clint, by the way, using the Scavenger Folk to get rid of the Jam Dayton. But hey, that still means an extra card here for, uh, for Edwin. So I think he got two cards out of the Tome, which is not too bad. And then he traded it for a creature, so could be worse. And okay, there is a Library of Alexandria. Tapping two more. There's the Osai Vultures, a 1 1 flying creature from Legends. And it has an ability, I believe, when a creature dies, it gets a counter on it. And then you can remove two or three counters, I believe. Uh, and then it gets plus one, plus one until end of turn. I mean, I wish it would have just be a, a plus one, plus one counter, because then still the creature is not too good. It's not overpowered at all, but it will make the card a little bit more interesting. And here we see Clint doing something, tapping four mana in total. What are we going to see here for four? Ooh, there's a Cyclopean Tomb. So he can use this card to create, turn lands into swamps. And uh, yeah, that could be a problem on the long run for Clint. I mean, for Edwin, because Clint is playing the card. Again, it's a nice way to get rid of, for example, the Library of Alexandria, but also to deal with mazes of if of your opponent, which remember Clint, of course, has this strategy with the evil eyes. Ooh, there we see a divine offering. This is a great move by Edwin because he takes care of the artifact, but also gains four life, I believe. I think it's four to cast this uh, artifact. So he's going to go up to 23. And there he goes. Now he's up to 23. So yeah, a really good response here by, uh, by Edwin. Because like I said, I think on the long run, the card could have been problematic. Four cards in hand for Edwin. Looks like he's going to cast something else. So choosing not to kind of build up to seven. There are the Barbary Apes. I think it's a 2-2 from Legends for one green and one. Basically, the Grizzly Bears from Legends. And yeah, there's not really a good attack here. Also because Clint has two Mazes of If and that uh, Will-O-The-Wisp. It's really tough to deal with. I guess he could have considered attacking with everything because then I think Clint would have had to regenerate the Willow and that would have 
uh, meant that he would have uh, take, uh, taken damage, I think, from City. Although he had uh, Birds of Paradise untapped, so he could have done it that way. Anyway, here we see an all-out attack into the red zone. Edwin's going for it. 2-2 two, two Barbary Apes, 1-1 one, one Osai Vultures, and 2-1-1 one, one Asps going into the red zone for a full attack. I wonder if he has like a giant growth in hand or some other trick up his sleeve. Clint going through his hand as well. I mean, it's, it's not looking that bad for him. I mean, they're all pretty small creatures. Is he going to play a darkness? Yeah, he's going to play a darkness. Yeah, that is <laughs> that is funny. Again, I love seeing this, these cards. You don't see that often. It's really cool. And then a second main. We're going to see another Barbary Apes being cast. And I think next turn, probably Edwin is going to turn his creature sideways again and kind of attack. He's got, he's got a lot of beasts out there. But I think the double maze and also the, you know, the willow, that already stops three creatures. There's a Sylvan Library and a pass turn. I believe only one card in hand now for Clint. There's the untap for Edwin. Going to draw for turn. What is he going to get? I, I, I think exactly. You just want to turn it sideways again. That's what I wanted to say. Why not? Let's do it again. There we go. But now he's, he's, he has an extra ape to attack with. So two two twos and three one ones. One of those one ones is flying. Another darkness. Yeah, of course. <laughs> and I guess actually Clint had two cards in hand, by the way, instead of one. So yeah, another uh, another darkness. Why not? Then second main, we see Edwin tapping quite a lot here. What's he going to cast? Oh, there's a Darkwood Boars. Four four. So, you know, Edwin's just really casting out all his creatures and just turning them sideways and trying to deal some damage, which he's not very successful in thus far. But, I mean, it is costing Clint cards. So instead of dealing damage, it's like he's discarding a card every single time, which is also worth it. And now Clint can look at the top three with the Sylvan. If he wants, he can draw an extra one, but he has to pay four lives for that. He's on 17, so he could consider doing it, but just passes the turn without playing anything and that could even indicate or he's found another darkness or all those three cards on top are not evil eyes of orms by gore or an underworld dreams so nothing for him to deal damage with which is good news if you're edwin i guess okay here's a strip can strip a mace Ooh, that makes a difference and now everything is going to go into the red zone again look at that so he just keeps tapping it all sideways and saying you know clint you have to deal with this you do your thing And it looks like he's going to block some stuff. So he's going to block the Asp. going to make the trade. Is he going to block the Flyer here, for example? The Vultures. Exactly. You would block the 2-2, two, two, right? Take less damage. Send back the Boars. Ooh, he's got a Giant Grove, perhaps. What is that card? Oh, it's a Berserk. So he's going to play a Berserk on the Boars and then use his Mace. Which means it kills it. So, you know, Berserk and Mace is a pretty nice combination to turn your, your Berserk into a kill spell. He is going to take 4 damage, though, so he would drop to 17. Are we going to see a Pump spell, though? That's the question. If he plays a Giant Growth, he would take an extra 3 points of damage. So, 4 points of damage now. There's a Giant... Oh, Giant Growth on the Asp to keep the Asp alive. Yeah, that kind of makes sense as well. You want to keep attacking, keep the pressure on. And he's got another one, another giant growth. Okay, so five, six, seven points of damage in total. And his Asp is going to survive. So Clint is going to drop here to 10. Yeah, this was a really good attack. And of course, the Dirkwood Boars is going to die. But yeah, Clint's on 10. Life total halved. And I think it's also very important to, you know, play aggressively when your opponent has cards out like Sylvan Library because for four life, you can draw an extra card. So if you can deal damage, you kind of make it impossible for him to get that advantage out of the Sylvan. And now we see Clint pay one. So he could have paid that one also in the turn of Edwin with the Asp. And now we can look at the top three cards. I mean, he needs he needs a blocker or, or a darkness. 
An evil eye would simply be the best. That would be the best option. So 3-6 can kill those creatures. It would be ideal. And here we see Clint going through his graveyard. Does it mean that he maybe has a regrowth? Tap the City of Breast, take another damage, go to 9. That is a regrowth. Okay, what is he going to get back though? Another maze, of course. Yeah. It's as simple as that. But I think if you're Edwin, you're not too worried about this. Because yes, the maze can stop a creature, but that's all it can do. It cannot kill a creature. So it means you can keep attacking with everything. And I mean, look at the creatures on the side of Clint. You know, you've got your birds and your... your uh, your Willow, they're not going to kill any of your creatures. So exactly, just turn everything sideways again. Let's party, right? Bring it on. And now we see two counters on the Osai Vultures, by the way. So maybe we're going to see that plus one, plus one activation. So there is the attack. Talking about the Vultures. It's going to block the Vultures. Use two of the mazes, probably on the asps. Oh, of course, on the apes, because they've got two power. That makes more sense. But this is annoying, though, for Clint, because then you're going to take damage, and you've got two of those counters from the asps. He's going to use his birds to regenerate the willow. So he's now on seven, and he's going to get two counters. And look at that. There we see the little book that I talked about in the introduction. So Edwin created... Uh, this deck that he's called Africa and every card there is linked to the African continent So if you ask him maybe now Clint's asking hey, how does this card link to the African continent? He takes out his book and he reads it out to you He says in what region it is and all that stuff. So it's, it's really cool very flavorful and uh, yeah, These are just two players having a lot of fun today and uh, there's the pass We see Clint untapping everything trying to stay alive I think the big problem for Clint in this specific game is that he couldn't find the Evil Eye of Worms. It's just a really important part of his deck. And now he's got to pay two mana because of those Asp counters. So that's what he does right now. So he doesn't take extra damage. Yeah, and the Asp counters are kind of becoming a nuisance for Clint. Because if you're Clint and you're on seven, you don't want to use those City of Brasses. But because you already lose two mana to the counters, you're kind of forced to at a certain point. At least this is a, another blocker, which is good. A Lanara Elves, 1-1 one, one creature. So you can trade that for an Asp next turn. And again, if you're Edwin, just turn your creature sideways. It's all you have to do here. And there he goes. So everything goes into the red zone. And we're going to see exactly a Lanawer being thrown in front of the bus. Going to try to stop the Asp, make the trade. The Willow again, regenerating, probably going to send back. Yeah, then he has to take the damage from the city. So annoying for Clint here. Uses the Mazes, but still takes one damage from the Asp. Going to drop to five. Does he want to do something? Does he have another pump spell? Oh, he's going to eat up. He's not going to trade. I think I would trade here. It's better to trade because then Clint, exactly, then Clint loses a blocker and your Vultures gets another counter. Two, actually. I believe, at least, but perhaps maybe that happens at the end of the turn. I really need to read Osai Vultures again. I mean, you have to excuse me. I don't play with the card every day. <laughs> but I think he's missing a trigger here from the Vultures. I'll put it up on the screen so you can you can have a look at it. Anyway, uh, Clint looking at the top three again, picking a card. Oh, and he's taking a damage here from the Asp. Deciding not to pay or maybe forgot to pay for it. So he's on four now. Wow, that Asp uh, doing work there. There's the pass. There, the attack again with the Asps. Just with the whole army. And yeah, Clint is really entering a world of pain. Going to put the bird in front now, so he's going to sack the bird, I guess. Sending back the two apes. He's going to take a damage from that asp. Going to go to three. And now he can actually pay for the counter that he gets from the, nasp, from the asp. And yeah, now um, Edwin is remembering the counter, so putting the counters back on the vultures. I've actually never seen an Osai vultures before with this many counters. That's funny. I hope there's going to be a moment in the game, Edwin, that you can use those counters, but 
I don't think it's going to happen. And again, Edwin here um, pointing out that he has to pay for the ASP. So three cards now for Clint to look at. Problem is he doesn't have enough life to draw extra cards. So he's kind of stuck here. Trying to find a way out of this. There's a swamp. One card in hand, passing the turn back. Yep. If that if that one card is a darkness, then he has one more turn, I guess. Again, attack with everything. There's a regeneration, and um, that's the game, I guess, or not. No, he's going to end up on one. He's not dead yet. And then he's going to pay in his upkeep again. So one life for Clint. Going to draw a card. I mean, he doesn't have any board wipes in his deck, I believe. You know, because a board wipe could, could help him. Obviously. I mean, I think if you now draw into a darkness, yes, that can postpone your death at least a turn. Nope, that's it. Clint picking up the cards, saying you've got this one. So both players are going to dive into their sideboards. And we will catch back up with them in game number two. And here we go. Game number two. Clint on the play after losing that first one. Starting here with a Soul Ring. Look at that. Altered Lord of the Rings card. So Soul Ring turn one. Which is always a good start. Does that mean that we could potentially see an Evil Eye turn three? That would be quite nice. Anyway, first is Edwin's turn. Let's see what he can do on his turn one. There's a Savannah passing a turn. Unfortunately, no Savannah into Savannah lines. Not yet, at least. There's a City of Brass. Going to take a damage. Going to drop to 19. There is a Sylvan Library and a pass. So not really going to use the Soul Ring yet. There is a Barbary Apes 2-2 creature. So there's some uh, pressure for Edwin. He can start attacking with it in next turn. And now, of course, Clint looking at the top three because of that Sylvan Library. Picking a card there. There's a mace to stop the Barbary Apes in the pass. Edwin drawing for turn. There's a forest. There's just a pass, not even trying to attack here. Of course, Clint had that maze, so we probably just used the maze. That's it, but still. Now let's see what Clint can do. Picking up another card. There's a swamp, so he's got five mana now. But just passing the turn, though, it's got three black as well for an Underworld Dreams, but I guess he doesn't have one or else he would have played it out. So just passing the turn back to Edwin. Edwin dropping land number four. Is he going to play out a War Elephant, for example? No, another ape. Barbary Apes number two. And then next turn, could attack with both. Try to put in some damage. Clint at uh, 19. Edwin still at 20. And here we see Clint picking up a uh, City of Brass. Passing the turn. So both players still kind of building up. Slow, uh, slow game thus far. And I think Edwin's probably going to tap his attackers here, try to put in some damage. Going to tap something first. Tap three. Tranquility. Ooh, to take care of that Sylvan, of course. There's the attack. And he's going to tap a City of Brass here for a Berserk. So he's going to do that trick again with Berserk and Mace. So that will kill one of the apes. He is going to take two from the other one, though. So he's going to drop to 16. And there's the pass again by uh, by Edwin. So yeah, it's, it's kind of nice, kind of funny, I have to admit, to see that Berserk Mace combo being played out twice in a row now. You don't see that often. And there is a regrowth. One floating and using that one tapping the city. To play it out again, he is going to take some damage, of course, from the City of Brass trigger, so going to drop to 14. I believe that Mage is untapped, if I'm not mistaken, so he can use it again to protect himself from the Barbary Apes. Exactly, that's what Edwin is uh, 
pointing out now as well, and he's going to take his turn. Untap, upkeep, or draw. What are we going to see by the Africa player? There is a Mox Emerald. Is he going to tap five for a Dirkwood Boars? He's going to tap four. Ooh, there's a War Elephant. I love this card. I really like the art of War Elephant. It's four mana, uh, one white and three for a 2-2. Two -two. Uh, yes, a 2-2 two -two for four. Uh, but it has two abilities, Trample and Banding, together on a card. And I believe it's the only white card in old school that has those two abilities together on one card. From the color white, of course, then. Uh, anyway, Dark Ritual here into an evil eye. So you can see Clint really doesn't want to take the damage, um, you know, from the City of Brasses. Again, some glitches here, unfortunately, but they're gone. And Evil Eye, so this is a 3-6 that cannot be blocked. So it's pretty good. And, of course, it can block as well. So this means uh, trouble for Edwin. I think if you're Edwin, you're really kind of hoping to draw into a Desert Twister to get rid of it. He does play with one Wrath of God, I believe. So looking at the Evil Eye now, yeah, you cannot block it. And, uh, yes, that is a problem. Because that means three damage a turn. So going through his hand now. Playing out another Savannah. Tapping a white. Oh, Spirit Link. Yeah, of course, he also plays with Spirit Link. Forgot about that card. So Spirit Link, an enchant creature from Legends. And that means all the damage you take, you get back in life. So you first take the damage and then gain the life. And there's a giant spider and a pass. Still, it's it's a useful blocker for Clint. So the game is kind of in a lock again, and uh, we saw that a little bit in uh, in the first game as well. There's a tap for four. Oh, there's a Nevenerals disc. Ooh, he can start blowing everything up. The question is, does he want to? I mean, he's not in the position yet that I think you would really want to want to pop the disc, but it's a nice insurance policy to have. I mean, I think if you're Edwin, you could... Yeah, there's not really an attack, is there? I won't say you could consider, you know, banding the War Elephant with your Barbary Apes. You have a 4-4 and then attack with the Spider as well. The problem then is that you're going to lose a creature. So, oh, there's another Maze. Wow. Now the game is really in a lock. And I, I, I think if you're Edwin, you're just going to have to hope that you draw into something. Right, maybe a Desert Twister to get rid of a maze, but even then. You could also consider, maybe if you have a Desert Twister, to, to play a Twister on the disc and kind of force the issue on Clint. But yeah, I, I, I think this could be a long, long uh, game number two. He's going to tap three black. Are we going to see an Underworld Dreams? Yep, there's an Underworld Dreams. Yeah, and this is a perfect position for Clint, right? This is the control game he wants to play. He's like, I've got full control of the game, and you're just going to take a damage return with the Dreams, and I'm fine with that. I can just sit back, drink my beer, and wait for game number two to end. Ooh, a tap of five. Are we going to see Dirkwood Wars? That would be a five. Exactly, Dirkwood Wars, 4-4 four, four creature, vanilla from Legends. Hitting the board, so a lot of creatures again on the side of Edwin, but no way through, at least not just yet. And there we see an Asp. The Asp that did so much work in that first game. And again, Clint looking at the top three cards. Trying to find something useful. There's a forest and a pass. Edwin untapping again. What is he going to do? It's going to drop to 18, draw a card for turn. There is another land. Ooh, it looks like he's going to attack. Putting everything sideways. I love it. He's going like, you know what? This is what my deck wants to do. I'm slowly dying if I don't do anything here. So I'm just going to attack. And we see Clint here looking at the creatures, of course. And also Edwin didn't attack in a band. I wonder if Clint has a darkness and if he wants to use the darkness. So he's going to send back the Dirkwood Boars. What other creature is he going to send back? 
He's going to send back the elephant. That surprises me a little. I think I would have sent back the giant spider and then blocked the elephant on the evil eyes. But maybe he's got different plans. Going to block the Barbary apes. So going to kill the apes. And then take three damage. From the spider and the asp. And of course, Edwin is going to gain six because of that spirit link on the evil eye. So it's going to go, uh, sorry, three. So he's going to go up to 21. Six would be a bit much. And he gains three, by the way, because the evil eye has three power. So dealt three damage and Edwin's going to gain the damage he deals in life. So uh, he's now on 21 and Clint just passes the turn. Ooh, there we see a word of command being played out. Yeah, I was hoping for this to happen. So I discussed word of command in the deck deck section. If you're wondering about this card, you can go back there. And uh, look at that. He's now giving all the cards away saying, you know, do your best. And we see a sandstorm there. He could play the sandstorm, I guess. What is he going to do? He's going to tap four, it seems. So with word of command, you can take over the hand for... Oh, there's a Wrath of God in hand. He's going to play the Wrath. Oh, man, this is painful. Wrath of God wiping the board. Yeah, pretty good move by Clint. And really nice to see the word of command in action. A beautiful card that I believe deserves more play. Actually, I don't own one, so I have to confess. It's another card still on my list. 11 life here for Clint, but that was a really nice move. And there is a Will-O-The-Wisp and passing the turn. I mean, the thing is, Edwin's still on 19, so yes, Clint, it's looking good for him, but if the Underworld Dreams is his only strategy, we'll be here for quite a while still. There's another Osai Vulture, so the 1-1 Flyer. And that's, of course, the card that gets a uh, plus one, plus one uh, counter at the end of the turn every time a creature dies. And then you can take two counters off to give it plus one, plus one until end of turn. And Edwin now dropping to 18 because of the dreams after he drew that card. So slowly but surely, Clint is uh, getting closer to a victory. He's on 11 at the moment. He's going to tap the soul ring. Tap some more stuff. So five in total. Ooh, there's another evil eye. Yeah, this can make a big difference. Evil eye three sixer is back. Question is, can he start attacking with it? Or can Edwin find, for example, another spirit link? Going to go through his hand. Going to tap a white. Ooh, another spirit link. Wow. That is unfortunate. And another Osai Vultures. So, I mean, the Vultures fly, obviously, so they go over the Evil Eye and over the Elves of Deep Shadow. But then we still have two mazes to deal with, and, of course, that Willow as well. So he's got three really good blockers for flying creatures also. Here we see a Strip Mine. Stripping just away one of the lands, passing the turn, I guess or not. Yeah, passing their turn. I think, to be honest, if I would have been Clint, I think I wouldn't have used the strip mine just yet. Because that one land doesn't make a big difference, but we do know that Edwin has some pretty good lands in his deck, including a Library of Alexandria, so maybe you want to keep your strip for that. And uh, Clint here finding another card, going to tap four. What is he going to do? Actually, five. There's an evil eye again. So what I really like about this game too is that Clint, you're finally finding your evil eyes. I'm loving it. And then the question is, does Edwin have another spirit link? That would be really insane. He's going through his cards, playing out another land, another Savannah. And the problem here for Edwin is, I mean, his, his deck is so creature heavy and that's actually 
what Clint loves because, you know, his deck is all about stopping creatures. I think he could even consider adding an Arborea in his deck. Talking about Clint, Clint and his, uh, his strategy. So two Ois, Ois, Osai Volt, Oisai, how do you pronounce it anyway? O Osai Vultures. Anyway, two of those, one one flyers and a giant spider and an asp. There's the pass of the turn. And Clint looking at the top three again. But now we should see the game speeding up a little bit. He can start attacking with the evil. I put three damage in. Ooh, look at this. He's going to take an extra card. Wow, that's the first time I've seen him using the Sylvan for an extra card. Dropping to eight. And yeah, of course you're going to attack, right? So he's going to attack with a three, six. Going to put Edwin on 13. And of course, Edwin's going to take a damage. Going to draw, going to go to 12. And it looks like the players are forgetting about the uh, Underworld Dreams trigger here. And here we see a Diamond Valley. And yeah, this is kind of why I wasn't too positive about that Strip Mine play earlier by Clint. I'm like, you know, just keep the Strip. There's so many special lands in old school that, you know, the Strip is too good just to to use so quickly. And you see more players do that, by the way. As soon as they have a strip, they just automatically strip a land on the side of the opponent just because they can. And sometimes it's a good move, but sometimes it's you do it just because you can, then it's usually not a good move. And Clint here uh, going through the top three cards again. Going to tap three. Another Underworld Dream. So hopefully they can... Okay, now Edwin realizes that he missed the trigger. And they're discussing, did you miss the trigger? Yeah, this is tough. This happens to me as well with all these triggers. What I usually do, but again, I also miss triggers plenty of times. I put my life, my dice on my deck, or at least one of the die, um, so I don't forget the triggers. Like, I have the same thing with Copper Tablet. Anyway, uh, he, t he does take the damage. Now goes to 12, then takes 3 from the Evil Eye, goes to 9. Then there's a pass turn, 2 damage. Now he's on 7. Ooh, it's looking, it's looking, uh, it's looking bad here for Edwin. Needs to find something, but all he can find is this Dirkwood Boars, another 4-4 four, four creature hitting the table. He does have the Diamond Valley, of course, can start sacking some creatures at a certain point in the game, but that's not really where you want to be. So there's the untap of the Evil Eye, then we're going to go to the upkeep and the draw phase. Yeah, I think just turn the eye sideways, going to put Edwin on 4. Then he takes 2 more damage, goes to 2, and then he's kind of forced to start using... The, um, the Diamond Valley, but here we see something happening on the side of Clint, tapping 4-5. Another Evil Eyes, so he's drawn his full playset of Evil Eyes in the second game. Edwin taking damage, gonna go to 2. He could have used the Diamond Valley on end step, so he would go up to 6. Then he could untap, use it again, that maybe could have given him another turn. Yeah, there we see the Alpha Strike. I love it. You go down with a bang. I love it. I love it. I love it. Attacking here with the two vultures, the spider, the boars, and the asp. The whole zoo is attacking. Willow here blocking the vultures. Go to send back the other one. And sending back the boars. Blocking the spider. And putting the elves in front of the other. Yeah, I think this is good. You don't want to block with the evil eye with the spirit link on it. You don't want to give life here. Yeah, I think if you're Edwin, you, there's nothing really you can do here. You're on two. Yes, you could, for example, sack the Dirk would go back to six. But I mean, he's got two evil eyes on board. If you have a giant growth, you could use... No, you could even can't even use the giant growth here to kill the evil eye because it's got six toughness. Yeah, he's going to eat the spider here. So he goes up to six. But it's not going to help him. What could have saved him one more turn is if he would have had a giant growth, played a growth on, for example, the spider, then sack the spider, he would gain seven life. But, you know, that would have been a bad play as well because, yes, you survive one more turn. 
Or does he have divine offering? No, he's got a Savannah Alliance. Anyway, to, uh, to make a long story short, he's probably going to die now. There's the untap, upkeep, and into the draw phase. He's going to look at the top three cards again with the Sylvan. Because I don't believe uh, Edwin plays with Fog in his deck. That's, of course, a card that could have saved him here. So Clint attacking and dealing six. That's it. You can see it in the hands of Edwin. He's saying, that's it. You got it. So game number two is going to go to Clint. And I'm happy with that because it means we have another whole game with these two fantastic fun decks to uh, to look ahead at. So let, uh, let's give these players some time to shuffle, maybe order another beer, and then we will catch back up with them in game number three. Game number three, the big decider, Edwin on the play, starting with a Savannah, again, not into a Savannah Alliance. So many missed opportunities here, passing the turn uh, to Clint, who's starting by you into Birds of Paradise. And uh, yeah, nice to see a game three. And look at that, there's an Osai Vultures. I think that's how you pronounce it. I did some, I did some practicing. So the Vultures hit the board, 1-1 Flyer from Legends, that they now know how it works, because I read it. So every time a creature dies, you put a counter on it, and then you can remove two counters to give it plus one, plus one until end of turn. Uh, there we see a lot of elves and also a uh, Sylvan Library. So Clint is really off to a very quick start. And I think that should worry Edwin here, because I think Edwin is more of the aggressor. Look at him go here, Giant Grove on the Vultures. There is another Barbary Apes, 2-2. Two, two. So uh, both players... Playing aggressive, uh, well, actually having quick starts because Clint is not playing aggressive. That's something I think his deck just cannot do. There's a maze. I mean, if this would have been a land and then he would have could have played an evil eye, it would be kind of aggressive, but there's the pass. There's a strip on the maze. This is really good, this strip mine, because that means he can keep the pressure on. Probably going to put both creatures sideways. Exactly. So it could potentially deal three more points of damage. There's a growth. Ooh, there's a darkness. Yeah, this darkness is really good by Clint. There's a giant growth getting back the sorry, a regrowth getting back to giant growth. So uh, yeah, both players trying to play quickly here. Perhaps also because it's the third game. Remember, we are at the tournament, meaning these games are timed. You have 50 minutes to play your games, and I think uh, you know game one and two were quite long. So perhaps these players have to hurry up to get this third game in. And we see Glinter going to 13, drawing an extra card with the Sylvan. He's got five lands, well, five mana again, three lands and uh, two mana dork. So again, could cast Evil Eye, but just passes the turn. There's the attack again. Is Clint gonna drop to 13? Who is gonna block here? Wow, look at that. He's just jumping. Does that mean that perhaps he's got a Neverneural's Disc in hand? Three cards in hand, looking at the top three. There's a Bayou. Passes to turn back, so no Neverneural's Disc. So I'm a little bit surprised to hear about that Chump earlier in the game. And yeah, he's gonna get counters, of course, from those two creatures that died. And yeah, he's using the Vultures, using the ability. I'm happy. <laughs> I, think, I think it's the first time on the channel we've seen someone use that ability. So he's going to deal four, and then the Giant Groves is going to deal seven damage in total. Wow, and, and, and Clint is really in trouble here. He's on six. I mean, it's going so fast all of a sudden. Okay, there's the Neverneural's Disc. Ooh. If he has a Giant Grove, he can win the game. But if not, there's the attack. Going to put Clint on three. No Giant Grove, that means we're probably going to see the disc activation next turn or in Edwin's turn in combat, one or the other. Going to look at the top three cards. Not ideal here. There's the Swamp, there's the Pass, and the draw for turn. There's the attack, then of course the disc activation or else he dies. Then in second main, he can play another creature if he has one. Gonna tap five. Dirkwood Boars! Is it gonna be the Boars for the win? 
Is it gonna be the boars for the win? 4-4 four, four, vanilla creature. Glint needs an answer. At least a blocker. Nope, it's Dirkwood Boards winning it here for Edwin, the player with his deck, Africa. So winning 2-1. But yeah, what, what a fun guys, fun decks. Thank you for sharing uh, you know, your decks on the channel. I think you both must really love the old school game and looking at your deck picks, that really, really, really shows. Thank you so much for showing your skills here on the channel. And also thank you for watching another episode right here on Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And if you'd like to support the show, you can by becoming a patron. Check out patreon.com slash Timmy Talks. And you can also support the show by just leaving a like, leaving a comment, sharing this on your socials and hitting that subscribe button. All these things help the channel move forward. And of course, we will be back next week with more action from the Dutch X-Points Open. And for now, thank you for watching and let's go to the end scroll. What shall we do with the drunken sailor? What shall we do with the drunken sailor? What shall we do with the drunken sailor? What shall we do with the drunken sailor?